would like now to invite Frederick uh, to come up to the stage, and maybe we could all move up to these tables, and we will have a small Q&A session. What we've heard so far this morning is obviously that the challenge is daunting, but we also heard about the two different angles to address these issues. Now, Carl and Frederick, I'd like to ask both of you, because <clears throat> We are taking the time of some very important people here whose industries, whose business, whose investments depend upon what is going to be the future um, energy system, but also regulatory system. So I'd like to start off by asking both of you about what do you see as the future solution? Frederick, when you sit in the commission, how do you see um, the regulatory tools that are about to be developed, and, and second of all, you know, how can Europe do this alone? Please. Well, I think that the mandate we are brought to this advisory group for Commissioner Oettinger is very clear because uh, it tells that we, it tells that we are going to. It tells us that we are going to come up with suggestions for additional efforts to the emission changing system. Um, I think that's based on an understanding that we don't get a global binding uh, agreement on emission trading, uh, and that if Europe and the US is going to move ahead, we need to put in operation other efforts. Uh, emission performance standard was mentioned, carbon border tax adjustment is also discussed now a carbon floor price. Uh, the European Commission has accepted through the financing program for the, for the CCS that the, the price of uh, carbon is not high enough, but we need the technology. But I think that what we see is also in the US, the tools that's available there is that we have a Supreme Court uh, accepting that the EPA are able to force in the different states different kind of more mandatory regulations. I think that will be a part of the future, both because of the climate issues, but also because of both Europe and the US uh, needs to reduce their uh, uh, economic costs of importing fossil fuel. And to be able to do that, you have to do it in a way without moving the industry to, to low uh, cost economies. Uh, and, and that's not the way to do it. Carl, we hear here that uh, Europe has an approach with uh, uh, legally binding instruments uh, developed in the whole EU. We see that in the US, it takes another pattern. Um, the novelties in California, when will they reach Washington? Well, it's not just in California. You probably know there's about 23 states that have various forms of requirements for realizing greenhouse gas. And actually, if you really think about the renewable energy implementation it started off partly as an answer for greenhouse gas offset or abatement and uh, the justification of paying the additional price for the pond that I think it's now gone beyond that as a, a viable alternative sor source of energy and recognized. Having said that, going more to your question, I think the, the experiment, so to speak, in California and these other states is being recognized in the arguments in Capitol Hill and the Washington DC federal level. Uh, and obviously all those states that have those kind of laws in place and are implementing things have representation in the Congress, both on the Senate and the House sides, who bring that viewpoint more actively into the discussion. And probably uh, my view is it will be uh, 2012, which is our next election cycle, before we really get some resolution of which way we're going to go most aggressively. And then it will be a couple years after that before we start seeing it. So, I always think about this whole process like the uh, Clean Air Act engagement. If you remember Clean Air Act engagement in Europe or in the United States, it didn't happen one month and then it, everything was in place in six months. It, it happened and it took almost 10 years of argument and, and suit and counter suit about meeting requirements because it costs money to do these things. And so uh, there's real arguments to be made as to what's the best way and what's the financial impacts I think on something like greenhouse gas, which is a global issue, and they don't call it uh, U.S. warming, although some people suggest it is, <laughs> or European warming, they call it global, 
Now, the biggest challenge is going to the emerging nations, and some of them emerging rapidly, like China and India, um, and Brazil. Uh, they balance of trade, the cost of products is uh, going to be impacted by uh, less cost of labor and what they do in dealing with their greenhouse gas, and that is going to be an argument that uh, Europe and the United States have to deal with, as well as recognizing the liability. Dave, you mentioned earlier about the elephants. I always wondered why they fly, but now I understand. Uh, so I think it's going to take uh, another year or two, probably two years, to start to see more aggressive legislation at the federal level. I think there will be possibly an energy bill out of this next session, but it will be more about energy and less about greenhouse gas. And then, uh, based on the election for president and the new Congress that comes along with that, before we really see the process either pick up speed and go forward or get uh, a different pathway to go down. And I really can't tell you which it's going to be right now, because I think it's a big horse race in the United States right now. Thank you. So tell me then, Frederick, um, why should these people, uh, with their investments, with their industry, invest, continue to invest in Europe and not shift all their investments to other regions that have, are unlikely to have a climate mitigation regime? Why should they go, not go to China, to the Ukraine, to Russia? Um, we now know that Canada, Japan, Russia is it's clearly signaled that they will not commit to a uh, post-2012 regime. Well, I still think that both Europe and, and the US is a better place for, for innovation. Uh, and then I would like to add to that, you could do both, because it will happen a lot in countries like China, and what they're doing now also when it comes to wind and solar, is competing out some of the investments in Europe. And in one way, that's pretty, in another way, that's because we get the price down on renewables, so we should be happy. Mm -hmm. But I think what, what we see very clearly is that both the demand for reducing the costs of importing fuel uh, is a very important part of the solution is also to produce energy locally. And, and uh, that will be an enormous market both in Europe and in the in US. And the money you can say is quite substantial. I think that's, from my perspective, when we, when we make up the numbers, how much in tons, how many elephants is it out in the atmosphere, uh, how, is it, how much carbon is it back in the ground, there is, in a way, only a, a question, if not it's, if, if we get right in our views in the law, but when? because it will be like we said, because there is very few other options than using the fossil fuel with carbon capture and storage to produce the renewables. And, and this will be an enormous market. Energy efficiency will be an enormous market. But many ways I think the financial sector is, is uh, as big challenge as the technologies. And I feel quite confident that we will get the technologies but the financial market is still very early on these issues. It's uh, uh, not very familiar land, and that makes them unsecure, but it will come an environment, and this will be one of the big changes in the next 10, ten years. I think also the financial sector crisis show that in particular pension funds are looking, looking for new investment strategies, like uh, solar parks and things like that, that is long-term payback. So we see a change, but it doesn't go as fast enough. So we, what we do see is the emergence of regions, initiatives in regions. Now, Carl, how do you see the compatibility of the cap and trade system that's been developed in California and some states in the United States? How can we link this up with what's on the table in Australia, what's being set up in Europe? Can we see the architecture of a consolidated trading scheme between these regions? Is that difficult to do? I think it's difficult, but I don't think it's impossible. I, I know that in California, they're talking with three provinces of, of Canada, uh, with a very positive engagement about city and the carbon uh, trading recognition if their cap and trade uh, process goes in place. They are talking with the states of Washington and Oregon, uh, who will also be part of it, and possibly several other the western states. So they'll have that in the northeast. There's the Reggie, although Reggie's uh, somewhat uh, weak right now. 
there been some uh, mistakes there, just like in the EU, there were some mistakes made about the trading, uh, but gotten past that. Uh, so I think those are things, I think as they stabilize, and there's the Chicago Exchange as well, as they stabilize and become uh, set, their ability to interact with each other would be to their interests, and I think they see that as a, from, a, from a financial standpoint, because now they have a broader set of exchanges possible. I, I think when we start talking about international exchanges with countries that aren't part of the trading scheme, uh, buying offsets from China, for example, that becomes a very important issue of how do you validate that the purchase of the offset really accomplished something. I mean, it's, it's nice to purchase the offset and credit it, but if the work that the offset suggests is happening isn't proven to have happened, it'll cause the, the whole foundation to erode. That's one of the concerns and arguments that the naysayers would bring in. How do I know that what they said they're gonna do is doing, it's kind of, if I mailed my paycheck to, to the bank and it turned out it was only a post office box and somebody took the paychecks and cashed them and didn't invest them, I couldn't, they didn't know that, that would be a bad thing when I wanted to make a withdrawal. So um, I hate to say it that way, but there are people who suggest that's one of the obstacles. So obviously, this is a new system. Uh, this will take time. But as we see the emergence of these combining regional efforts, I want to ask Frederick the last questions about the surprising support we saw in Bali Stanley Steve in the recent International Times yesterday about the carbon uh, border adjustment tax. Frederick, what is a carbon border adjustment tax and can it be efficient? I think that that the discussion on the carbon border tax adjustment will, will raise and that's uh, a way to measure the carbon intensity. Uh, on per kilo product or per product. Uh, this will be possible to do through the World Trade Organization's <laughs> regulations. It will, um, additionally, I think that it's important to keep the emission trading system. I think that additional, that we need uh, both a kind of emission performance uh, standard. But to do that, and that will reduce the need for import of energy. But to do that without getting the, I mean, in Norway we're privileged with clean melting industry from, from uh, the hydropower. We would like to avoid that that is moved to, to be operated by coal. Then CO2 intensity per the, on the product could, would be taxed when it's important. And in the plans we have seen the commission also, that money will be used to, to subsidize European products with a very low carbon uh, intensity. So this is the way to protect the industry, if US and Europe decide to move ahead without waiting for an international binding agreement. And what is the option? Just wait. That's, uh, that's not the option. So I think this will come. Thank you very much, both of you.